What are the legal implications of responding to an in-flight medical emergency? What are the most common conditions to look out for? And what resources are actually available in case this happens? So let's talk about in-flight medical emergencies. And first off, let's talk about liability and legal protections you have as a physician. Fear of liability has been cited as a reason preventing trained medical personnel from assisting. However, a 2002 review of air medical emergencies states that no case of litigation has ever been brought to a physician providing aid during an in-flight medical emergency. Furthermore, there's this important Aviation Medical Assistance Act of 1998, which states that the Good Samaritan is protected against malpractice litigation if the following conditions are met. They're medically qualified, they act voluntarily, and they act in good faith, and they do not engage in gross negligence or willful mis misconduct. And gross negligence, you know, if you make a small, you know, medical error on, on the flight uh, because it's an unfamiliar environment, that's not going to count as gross negligence. One of the biggest things that comes up is whether or not you can accept airline credit or uh, seat upgrades or vouchers afterwards. And, um, you know, based on this Aviation Medical Assistance Act, it says uh, you are protected against litigation as long as you receive no monetary compensation. Now, some people will advise you, you should also decline any free drinks that they give you or seat upgrades or things like that. However, according to the reading that I've done, Seat upgrades, mile credits, and travel vouchers are understood as a token of gratitude from the airline for the inconvenience caused and are not seen as compensation for services rendered. So if you want to be absolutely 100% safe, the best move would be to decline them. But I would say in 99.9% .9 of situations, this is not going to be a problem. You should feel free to accept those uh, tokens of gratitude. A quick little caveat. So if you are in the UK or in Canada, the law is similar to the US where you are not required to help if there's an in-flight medical emergency. However, if you are in the EU, such as in France and Germany or in Australia, uh, they actually have laws in which a physician can be punished by fine or imprisonment if they do not provide aid in, in case of an emergency. Now, uh, recommendations for avoiding legal complications is to obtain passenger consent whenever possible, use an interpreter if necessary, ask whether ground-based medical support is available to help, recommend diversion to the closest airport for any serious condition. And then uh, one thing that I would say is very key is to document uh, everything that happened in writing. This is something that I think a lot of people would probably forego, um, but this is actually something that I think is uh, would be very important for you uh, in terms of protecting yourself. Be cautious with unfamiliar interventions and do not accept or request financial compensation for any medical assistance. Also, do not provide assistance if you have uh, ingested any alcohol or medications that may impair your alertness or judgment. So what are some of the resources that are on board uh, a flight? So there's actually supposedly a standardized set of equipment that all airlines are supposed to carry in the US. And this includes things like a first aid kit, which is for general wound care and things like that, an emergency medical kit, which includes medications, and a universal precaution kit, which includes all your PPE. Now, some of the standard medications that are uh, supposedly required on all, on all these airlines is aspirin, 325, Benadryl, atropine, dextrose, epinephrine, bronchodilator, lidocaine, nitroglycerin, a non-narcotic uh, analgesic, uh, saline, AEDs, and a blood pressure cuff. And you've also got some other things such as a stethoscope, oral pharyngeal airway, gloves, needles, IV administration kits. Some kits, if they're fancier, may have some uh, additional medications. Um, you've got oxygen. Then you've also got the crew who is trained in CPR and AED use. Don't forget to definitely utilize the ground-based medical support. So they will call. There's going to be like an emergency physician on the ground who's experienced with in-flight emergencies who can help guide you through, you know, the best next steps. And don't forget there's other passengers on board who may have training as a nurse or an EMT, which could be very helpful for you. Um, and they may have other medications or equipment themselves. For example, if they're diabetic, they may have a glucometer or if they have uh, other medications medical conditions, they may have medica medications as well. So the decision to divert is something that a lot of people are worried about. But the good news is the captain remains the ultimate decision maker regarding a decision to divert uh, to a closer location, to have an expedited landing at the distant destination, or for requesting medical personnel to meet the flight upon arrival. All you do as the physician is uh, provide your advice or your recommendation, but ultimately the decision uh, lies with the captain. So that should take off a little bit of pressure for you. Now let's talk generally about some reasons for clinical decompensation 
on the airplane. So some of the common ones are sleep deprivation, anxiety, disruption in medication schedule, and transporting heavy luggage. One of the important ones is actually to note that there is reduced oxygen. So the cabins are pressurized to about 4,000 to 8,000 feet. So this actually drops your PaO2 from 70 to 95 to 50 or 60. So most healthy passengers drop from an O2 set of 99% to 94%, which is not usually noticeable to healthy adults. But if you have some underlying lung condition, this could you know, start to manifest as respiratory symptoms because of the decreased oxygen. You may also have transmission of airborne pathogens, although this is unlikely to really cause a, a significant decompensation that quickly, in my opinion. You've also got reduced ambient pressure, which is another major cause for decompensation of multiple conditions. So uh, diminished air pressure can lead to expansion of gas volume up to 30%. So this may cause a no pneumothorax, especially if you've had a, a history of pneumothorax or there's something pre predisposing you to pneumothorax, if you've had recent surgeries, uh, or if you've had anything in the GI tract that can expand the gas in your GI tract, causing uh, abdominal pain, um, dehiscence of surgical root wounds, things like that. And this can also affect any other medical devices that have air in them, such as urinary catheters, trach tubes, feeding tubes, and things like that. And finally, the air quality tends to be very dry, about 10 to 20% humidity compared to 40 to 70% humidity, uh, which is normal. And this can also trigger respiratory problems. So what are the most common conditions that you may encounter on a flight? So by far and away is going to be neurologic, accounting for 15 to 45% of the complaints. And syncope, you can argue whether that's really neurologic or not, but most commonly it's going to be vasovagal syn syncope versus potentially cardiac. Now the initial things that you should try and do is place the patient supine, keep their legs elevated, give them oxygen if needed, and check their glucose, which can be a very common cause of altered mental status on the airplane. If there's no recovery in 15 to 30 minutes, you should definitely recommend diversion to assess for more serious causes of syncope, such as arrhythmia, bradycardia, critical aortic stenosis, things like that. Seizures and strokes are going to be more rare, but it's definitely possible. And uh, you may have a benzodiazepine ready in uh, the, the emergency medical kit. Uh, but also, if you don't, you can ask passengers if needed. And you can see if this passenger had a history of seizures, they may have uh, additional doses of their anti-epileptic. And you can also give their anti-epileptics as a suppository if needed. If the seizure resolves, diversion usually is not necessary. For strokes, it's actually recommended against giving aspirin because, again, 80% of strokes are ischemic, but 20% are hemorrhagic. And in the absence of having a CT scanner, you're not going to be able to tell whether it's a hemorrhagic stroke or an ischemic stroke. So it's actually recommended to avoid aspirin and just immediately request diversion. Respiratory uh, symptoms account for 5 to 15% of complaints, usually uh, things such as an asthma or COPD exacerbation. So you should definitely check their pulse ox, give oxygen if needed, as well as bronchodilator as needed. After that, we have a whole host of other conditions. So GI, again, because of the expansion of gases, is going to cause potentially nausea and vomiting, which you can treat with anti-nausea medication, abdominal pain. Cardiac accounts for a significant portion, 10 to 30%. So if they have chest pain, you're going to be, uh, you know, giving them aspirin and nitroglycerin. A lot of times you can recommend diversion if you suspect an MI and you should recommend diversion. But keep in mind, a lot of these patients are not really going to be able to make it, you know, they're not going to have a door to balloon time of 90 minutes, um, you know, to get stented if they're having an MI. Usually the quickest diversions take uh, about two hours. Uh, and so the best you can do while they're on the plane is, medical management. Um, you know, you can even see if there's beta blockers available and see if that could help. Uh, and then cardiac arrest, which is exceedingly rare. It's less than 1% of all the cases of in-flight medical emergencies. Uh, but obviously, if that happens, you would have to run through all of ACLS. Uh, traumatic may happen due to falling luggage. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of basic uh, wound care, uh, you know, supplies if needed. And I would definitely request the help of a nurse or EMT or somebody like that who may have more experience doing that if you're not like an orthopedic surgeon or something. Uh, allergic reactions are common, and so you can have epinephrine and, and give antihistamines as needed. Diabetic hypoglycemia, probably one of the most common causes, especially because people are eating less while they're traveling. They may be giving themselves insulin. Uh, and so you should really suspect this and a low threshold to assess for hypoglycemia. And then finally, behavioral problems is becoming more common. Verbal de-escalation is preferred and caution should be used when trying to use sedative or restraints due to the risk of respiratory depression.
All right, and uh, I just wanted to pull this uh, just to give you some stats on the most common conditions. So this is from the New England Journal of Medicine. But on average, there is one emergency for every 600 flights. 37.5% were due to lightheadedness and syncope. 12.1% were due to respiratory distress. 9.7% due to GI vom and vomiting. And cardiac arrest and OBGYN cases accounted for less than 1% uh, of cases. Aircraft were diverted in less than 10% of cases, and the most common treatments were oxygen, IV saline, and aspirin. Finally, let's go through some examples of uh, some other YouTube channels who have recounted uh, some of their in-flight medical emergency experiences. At first, let's start with Dr. Mike, who uh, most people are probably somewhat familiar with, um, but you can see his video is called My Throat is Closing. So he saw a patient who was developing hand swelling and hives and eventually began to actually develop anaphylaxis. The patient was given prednisone, Benadryl, and then IM epinephrine. There was actually a problem in the kit because there was actually no EpiPen. It was just like a cardiac arrest dose epinephrine. So he actually just took the IV epinephrine and injected it into um, the patient's thigh. Uh, after that, the anaphylaxis began to improve. He continued Q30 minute checks and no diversion was required. This is a channel I found called The Medicine Couch. She's a physician assistant and the patient was presenting with tachycardia and dizziness, and there was some suspicion for possible slow GI bleed. Um, and basically, uh, they had a nurse who helped uh, start an IV. They started IV fluids. The patient began to feel better, and no diversion was required. This is the doctors Bjorkman. One of them's a pediatric cardiologist, and the other is an OBGYN. We've been watching lots of their videos recently uh, for you know learning how to raise a baby. But they actually had a pretty interesting case: a patient who was bradycardic to the 30s and 40s with a blood pressure 70 over 40, which sounds you know this is quite quite scary. Uh, and it was thought to be due for, uh, to an extra dose of soda law that the patient was taking. A nurse was present on board who helped to start an IV, and AEDs were placed in case the patient proceeded to uh, go into cardiac arrest. Uh, thankfully, they did not. IV fluids were given, and over time, the bradycardia and the hypotension began to resolve, and no diversion was required. This one is a doctor in the UK, Dr. Uh, Kieran Morharia, and uh, this patient uh, was presenting with nausea and vomiting. They were a type 1 diabetic, and they weren't able to hold down any of their uh, food, and so they began to have uh, quite significant hypoglycemia. So they were given glucose tablets, coke, and intramuscular Reglan to help with the nausea and vomiting, and no diversion was required. Uh, there's two actually from this me uh, medical YouTuber, Medlife Crisis, and uh, this was a patient who was having syncope and weak pulses, uh, likely from critical aortic stenosis. Uh, they hooked up an IV, they placed AEDs because the pulses were... Uh, kind of weak and eventually the patient improved and there was no need for diversion and then finally i think i actually got these videos mixed up in terms of the thumbnails uh, but this one was a patient with severe chest pain thought to be due to an asthma exacerbation versus an mi so both a bronchodilator and nitroglycerin were given they initially recommended diversion due to the concern for an mi but after those initial treatments, the patient improved and diversion was no longer needed. So here are six examples of some sample cases that have been experienced by uh, people on the YouTube sphere, just to give you a taste for what kind of in-flight medical emergencies may happen. So take home points. The risk of liability is low thanks to the 1998 Avi Aviation Medical Assistance Act. Um, just know that you, know, you should document what you've been doing. Best practices, don't accept any monetary compensation. It is okay to take uh, uh, little travel vouchers or seat upgrades, things like that, as tokens of gratitude. And also do not uh, get involved if you've had alcohol or any other sedating medications. Know the resources available on board. So we've kind of went through what the standardized list of equipment would be. And utilize the ground-based medical support. They're experts in these kind of emergencies and will really be able to help you make a decision on what the best next treatment would be, as well as whether the plane should be diverted or not. Uh, statistically, there's about one emergency every 600 flights and less than 10% require diversion. Less than 1% are cardiac arrest or OBGYN cases. So you can rest a little bit easy that 
A majority of the cases are going to be syncope, probably vasovagal or orthostatic. So check their vitals, check for hypoglycemia and elevate their legs. And then the rest of the cases tend to be respiratory, chest pain, allergic, and then finally cardiac arrest. Uh, you know, if that happens, get those AEDs on get an IV in and start the ACLS protocol. Hopefully this gave you a nice overview of some of the common conditions, some of the common questions about in-flight medical emergencies and how to deal with them. And please leave your comments down below if you have any experiences personally with in-flight medical emergencies. And I think we can all learn from you know the different cases that you guys may have experienced. Let me know down below, I'm very interested to hear. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next video, peace.